Yes, we get you hearing me at all. I hear you, I hear some words good, but no one then getting a heavy oh, it's in and out. Yes, so, oh my goodness. So, you were talking about um, about your passion, okay? Your passion for what you do. So, what you want to say about I don't want to come in because we have a lot of questions, but I, but when you said you, you were doing <laughs> like work, work at the YMCA. The Young Men Christian Association. Mm-hmm. I am I am here just to ask you. So you saw the degradation of Love Until and how the government allow Love Until young men and young people to fall through the track without yeah. grabbing the situation and attending to the young people in the schools of Port of Spain like yeah. like Mukurapo boys and girls and secondary school because while I used to be in Trinidad I saw where things started to happen so you were part right. you were wrong to witness yeah yes I I, I saw some of that first time really got to me because I asked myself what kind of society are we building where our young men don't have any hope any hope you know um, yeah, and I was actually very thankful that my son has grown up in Tobago because his father lives in Trinidad, and um, I would never want—I never wanted that upbringing for him. I never wanted him to be exposed to that kind of thing. We ain't gonna because we ain't, gonna, Tobago, know, we ain't gonna talk in them broad language because we don't want the people—we well, <laughs> don't want the young people of Trinidad to feel well they don't have anything oh, good no, coming no. for them. No, it's, it's not that, you know. It's, there are several things that happen. And I mean, young people are just sadly tied up in everything that is going on around them. The bad decisions that are being made over their head by the leaders and, and to let certain things fly. And our young people are really falling through the cracks, not because of their own doing, but because society has created this situation where it's hard for them to pick and pull themselves out of that and some young people have it but the majority of young people really kind of lacking that 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 hope and that will so that even now when we start to have conversations about um politics mm. and leadership young people don't want to no, hear they're about not, politics they're not listening because anymore. they are convinced, yeah that politicians are thieves that they lie that they come and they sell you a dream and then when they get in power they fix themselves they fix their friends and they forget about the young people and that they can and, and it's easy to send and, the young people and they to can jail, say that because to that jail is while the that older is. people doing the same crime like right students. so when they when they see all of that and they tell you that they're not lying they're telling you the reality how do we begin to fix that because there are a lot of relationships that we have to repair right there's a disconnect between my parents generation and us there's a disconnect between us and the generation right after us because i still grew up at a time when facebook didn't exist that, that when you had to quote well, a young God. lady you had to go by the people I think, I think and the yes people, so you I had to go by people I think the young people now are in a worse situation than us. They have Facebook right. because Facebook is so, not doing good for many young people. Right. So there's this, there's this, this the culture has completely shifted. So that even though we're close in age, we're world part in terms of how we were cultured, yes. how we were raised. Right. So there's a disconnect between my parents' generation and our generation. There's a disconnect between us and the generations that immediately followed us who came through when technology started becoming the way that it has become and who came through when the country was awash with money and awash with opportunities but but we didn't manage it properly you know so that that all of these these, these opportunities and these resources really didn't trickle down to the very lowest mm. levels of society for that and we, much of we, we have been the same, to their we have been the same problem to, 
you you think you diagnose what's oh, what's causing it is reception where you at in the house I... rain fell today oh. so i want to believe the reason the, why i'm happy the rain is because of what yeah <laughs> um, um i can switch let me see faith b is oh, really well, sending oh ah faith is sending a message here even if the feed breaks up a bit we can still hear oh this is a fantastic interview i'm so proud of the progressive democratic yes faith tell your face tell oh. your face democratic pdp tobago west candidate oh. yeah <laughs> yes we are all proud of you we are happy you. that you're here and <laughs> because i am getting a little jittery because Thank i believe you. people not hearing what you are saying and you have such great things to say so yes so from talking to you it is right. clear that you have a passion for volunteerism <laughs> I think that um one of the, one well as I said it started in high school with the young leaders program um what that was all of my life oh well that particular year we had an environmental theme so our project at Bishop's High School was the construction of an artificial reef so we partnered with uh, an NGO and a, a scientist and the idea was you know Buku Reef was going through some issues even way back when in terms of people walking on the reef and destroying the reef and you know the bleaching that was taking place and that kind of thing so the idea was is how do we arrest some of some of that so the what was you know we did some research and that kind of thing and at the time they were doing studies about the construction of artificial reefs so that went down in i think black rock i think mm -hmm. i think black rock we put down that artificial structure and being in fort form it was something very very exciting to be a part of um so that is why i have this 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 i love nature so that come from being in palo to Vera and going in the bush yes, and by the I beach and see. stuff island girl stuff so you know i i love my nature i love i love everything to do with nature so but really working at the ymca my first job that is where i fell in love with volunteering so even when i went on to the to the youth department I continued, my job was to work with youth groups. So I was getting paid to do that. And I was happy because it was assisting young people in youth groups to try to get their youth groups off the ground, to have them meeting, to join other young people in terms of positive after school interaction and encouraging positive activity in the communities. So during that time while we were at the youth department, the, the program coordinator was Anne-Marie de Gazon. And it was a very exciting time to be a part of the youth department. So there was support for our programs. We had several initiatives running in the, in the communities and it, it got me into certain communities. So Bethel, Bethel is, I love Bethel. Bethel has my heart. Black Rock has my heart. Canaan Bonacord has my heart. I met some great people there. Um, so, so all of those experiences really, really allowed me the opportunity to meet people and to grow as a person and to learn from person's experiences and to, to see the world through other people's eyes and, and what they have been through. Um, but after I left the, the youth department, I went on to the Port Authority. Port, um, port Authority. My job yeah. at the port was, okay. yes. yeah, it was very interesting. <laughs> so I, I had to take a pause on my volunteer activities during the time I was at the port. I was there for six years. I was uh, the customer service supervisor. So I was hired at the age of 22, the youngest supervisor to be ever hired at the port in Tobago. And one of the um, first females. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. So um, the idea was to transform the image of the port. Yeah, so those fast ferries had now come on stream and we were building that domestic tourism during that time. So I saw Tobago from a totally new perspective working at the port. Nice. And part of that, part all of these experiences, every single one of them. Yes, yes, yes. 
both of you. Well, so well, you, one of- you 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 show us how much you you know about building and from since you your father started to build the house and and how unfinished were the roads they in in yeah. unpleasant and everything so you so you saw so you saw life from a child from the building stage yes. until mm-hmm. the, the, the successful building or the roads yes. or the or the community so all along you doing building from the YMCA Yeah. In the YMC. So we are so excited to have you and to hear from you and to see where you get all these vibrations from. Right. So <laughs> you and I have much in common, okay? Good. <laughs> Including single motherhood. Can you tell right. us about your life as a single mom? And I'm hearing you said children. Yes. So you have two I have, children. I have two beautiful children. So I have a 16-year-old son. My son is writing CXC. Oh. So he's studying at this time. Yeah. And I have a 10-year-old daughter. How so old? Jada Natasiana, nine years old. Oh, nine. Okay, nine. Oh. Nine. You rested a while. So, <laughs> so how it is for you? Well, well you said, I call them my you, said you get help. I really didn't get that kind of help yeah. except for my sister-in-law right. and friends and family will chip in, you know? But right. then I, I, when it comes to taking care of my children, financially, morally, spiritually, yeah. socially, yeah, that is yes, me. <laughs> I, I, I try to do my best there. So, yeah. so how are you, how are you making out with the two children? Is your mom? Well, well, right now, right now, because of COVID, they are uh, they were quarantined by by grandparents' house, so they had everything there. They internet and they cook daddy cooking every day and you know they are my 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 parents eyeball right but your father is alive the first you know, he, he passed away yes very much so very much so give him very my regards so. give him my regards i will he's probably watching right now yes 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 <laughs> just let you know just let you know he's called just let you know he's called a friend in front of my hand the woman oh, by the yes, beach yes i will let him <laughs> yes, I, I remember your family yes, very, so well, well. very, very well. And I, I am so, so happy well. and proud of you and glad that you you, you you are moving into this new era at this age. You understand me? You're just like a, you, you, you're like a, a, politi- a young political phoenix that is rising out of the ashes <laughs> of like the that. political <laughs> scene of Tobago. I, yes, I like that yes. Is- I love that description. I absolutely love it. Yes. Um, yes. So there was a you know, question there for you about life as a single mother. Yeah, well we we did that. Well, I will tell you this much, eh? Um And what I want you to say, mm-hmm. I want you to speak. Speak the life and spirit of your act and what happened to you into the life of some young women or young men for today. Who experienced right. the same thing that you went through, and believing that that's the end of the world? I want you to right. talk to some mothers so. too, talk to some <laughs> fathers too. That we know, no. that oh. you know, what, give me, that you know what they believe that the kids deceive them, but it's not the end of the world. And as your mom supported you and your father, I want some mothers right now to listen to you and support. Their daughters who find themselves in that predicament. Let's talk. <laughs> talk to some young people. Um, I let me tell you something. When I found out that I was pregnant, my first. I honestly, I didn't even think about my parents. I, I didn't think about them. I thought about the fact that for me, because there was a decision to engage in certain activity. Yeah? So when you make that decision, there are consequences yes. that come with that, right? So early o'clock, I accepted that if the thing happened, I was going to go through with it. I and I made that decision way before I started doing the thing. <laughs> Because for me, for me, 
there is something to be said about people who accept the consequences of their actions. Amen. There are a lot of people who like to preach. There are a lot of people who like to point fingers. And they know within themselves that they are guilty mm. of running out of consequences of their actions. So you claim it? Yep. I claimed it very, from the first moment I claimed it. My fear, my fear was twofold. My fear was one, that mentally and emotionally, that I wasn't ready to raise my son. That was one. And my second fear was my relationship with his, his father, because I was in love. I was in love. I can say that. I, 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 this is the first time I'm actually speaking about it publicly. It seems no, so I, because... I never really told my side of the story. But, but you're, really, because, you're, you're, you're really doing a but, great job. Continue. This is the time. This is sometimes you have to speak truth to power, right? Yes. Right. So I was in my teenage version of love. Infatuation or love? I was in my teenage version of love. Okay. Right? I, I loved him. So that the idea of, of, of having a child with him, there was no doubt in my mind that that is what I wanted because this child was a symbol of the love that I had. Connection, you know? yeah. Yeah. And, and I, for most young women, it probably starts off like that. You fall in your version of love. Now, since then, I, I love has evolved for me. The whole I love concept that. of your love is evolved so that I know my version then is not the version that I ascribe to now <laughs> but back then you couldn't convince me that I wasn't in love you know mm. because this young man was the first man that I this young man and was the first person I felt listen to me you know we would talk for hours I would tell him all the things that I knew I would point out stars in the sky and we you know, we would, we would talk about all different kinds of things. And I felt like if he was so interested and so into me, and I was in love with the fact that he just simply listened, that I could talk, that I could be myself, that I could be nerdy, that I could be scared, that I could share my poetry, that I could share my heart, that I could say things that I couldn't say to anybody else to him. And sometimes that's how it starts. Now, you don't know the heart mm. of another person. You don't know what is in their mind but for me and, and that is, this is my truth I was in love so that the, the, the thought of having this baby was actually an exciting thing for me don't mind I was 17 mm. at the time don't mind that I, I just started working don't mind I just came out of school don't mind that society would have the world to say about me I felt that this is the thing that I needed to do because this was my truth but there were fallouts, obviously. Yes. Because I was ready and he wasn't. You know? Um, and then when I found out that he wasn't, it was kind of too late to do anything about it. So, so, how did your son father so, react when you all responded? When he heard of your, you young girl at head over heels that seen Moon when, when it is a star? Is a moon that I, you seem star? I, How did he respond? It? If I have to, if I have to be fair to the reaction now, as a thirty-four-year-old Tashia looking back, if I knew now what I knew then, I probably would have recognized his reaction as one of fear. Mm. And he had every right to be afraid. The thing is, is that. The woman carries the belly. The woman carries the evidence of the act. So that I don't, I don't get to be afraid. Somehow I have to dig deep. Somehow I have to, to do what it takes because I carry the belly. I the one who have to go out in public. I'm the one who has to, 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 to deal with people looking at and me in a particular me. way and judge me. And my family looking at me in a particular way and judging me. And then me assuming that everybody who looks at me in a particular way is judging me. And because you were so tiny. Yeah, but I look like, like a child. Like a child. Like a child. <laughs> I looked like a child. And he didn't have to live through that. 
he didn't have to live through that and men don't have to live through that so women somehow always have to find the strength we always have to be strong strong is a woman's default setting hey say that again yeah say that again. strong is a woman's default setting because society always forces us to find more to dig deep to be bigger to be better somehow and where we fail we are mad because we are the ones carrying that child everything that we think mm. we do that child absorbs so regardless of what was going on in my mind and my heart at the time i had to make sure that i brought my child into a world of love Amen. Even if that love was just mine. Round of applause. Round of applause. And my parents. Yes. Yes. You know, I, I could no longer think about my broken heart. My broken heart had to take a backseat to the fact that I was carrying and life inside of me. Eh? And I had to physically... Baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I had to physically, mentally, emotionally, financially, spiritually prepare myself for that. So that my broken heart really didn't matter. Mm -mm. I had to assume that it would feel at some point. But my child needed me. Amen. So Amen. You're I used to me, talk. You're, you're to sending myself. me right back, although I had my, my child when I was 22. But my mother wasn't you there. Know, she and, died and when I was 16. So, so right. you see, I had a lot of things right. going on within me, in my head. Yeah. You know? But mm -hmm. it's not about me today. I want you to explain. Yeah. How, you know, how do you how do you or would you explain your teen pregnancy to your children? I think for me. Are you coaching your son? I, don't don't leave him <laughs> out, you know. From the time from the time he could speak, I started telling him about body parts and girls and don't hit girls, you'll have a sister one day and you have to treat women well. And since he five years old so he can repeat that to you right now i am Amen. proud of the young man he's become because what i have also i've raised my children to do is to be able to to stand up for themselves and not be afraid to tell me anything even if it's something uncomfortable because we have that kind of relationship i would tell them I would give them keywords if it is something that I'm not ready to talk about, like from me, because a lot of times parents are not ready need to have the conversation. Yes, what but they brought to? you and my children that I'm uncomfortable because I have to get my mind right. Because when I have that conversation with them, I want to ensure that they get good information. I want to make sure that I communicate well to them so that they don't walk away misunderstanding what I say. I want to be in a frame of mind where I'm not angry, where I'm not anxious, where I'm not judging, where I'm not putting up walls, where I'm not feeling like if they can't talk to me again. So I am because I'm, I'm, a lot I'm of times kids are afraid to talk I'm to their parents. I'm a question to you now. What area of mm -hmm. communication that you didn't un you didn't understand that your mother and father was communicating to you? That made you believe that this guy is a better listener. You understand me? And, and oh Lord, um, to, to be fair, to be fair, I kind of retreated within myself when I became a teenager. So oh. I started to spend a lot of time by myself, and that is just me in general. I'm a, a very, very um private person and because of that i could have a thousand problems i could literally be dying and nobody would know because i wouldn't say anything because that's well, i just hope me. you don't i hope you don't take that into to the into the oh god right no now. I have to, when we feel stuff we have to of course not i have amen, to be able to express amen. myself amen i love that um, give yourself but, give, um, give yourself a round of applause but, this evening but, we are having such a powerful life but it, I want you to oh. listen to me. I want you we to have just to evolve. Right? We, have to we have to grow. I want you to talk to some parents now, mothers and fathers, and tell them how much this they have to. That. How much I was have afraid. To. I was afraid to have the conversation with my parents. Oh. I was afraid. I was afraid to ask. I, I and and it's it's almost like if. That generation kind of grew up, yes. you know, they, 
Your parents just hope for the best with you, especially with their girl children. They end up being with and you get married and live happily ever after and they don't have to worry about everything else. And obviously any any parent would want that for their children. You don't want to know that they have to get their heart broken or they have to go through bad experiences, you know, before they get they find happiness in life. Nobody wants that. So um I just kind of was afraid to have the conversation with my my father and my mother because at least from my father's perspective as 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 as, as old as I am now um i can say to him in a young man but i could say that back then obviously we, we because been, the thing was book book we, book, we, book, we book the same boys. Again. but you really can't say that to oh boy yeah i hope check it out and know. see if there's anything that you have to you have on a headset yes i do I put up these speakers and... I wonder if the technician can tell us something. Or if they, or if the audience can say whether or not they are getting it. Because I wasn't getting all of your words. I don't if they Right. Let us see if things... Go ahead, let me hear you now. It's better. Right. So, um... I... I... You're hearing me? I guess can hear well. Good, okay, the audience can hear <laughs> Good, that's nice. They can see my yes. pretty face <laughs> after. <laughs> so um I I was afraid because you know you grew up with this idea that you can't have these uncomfortable conversations with your parents. Um and uh, Again, with, with, with them at the time, their focus would be just providing for you and making sure that you have everything that you need, that you could go to school, that you have your books, you, can, you have clothes, you can you yes. have, you eat, you're healthy, you know? Um, and as, a, as, a, as for me, when I had my, my children, I decided early o'clock that I had to have an open door, open communication yes. with them. And I cultivated that very, very early from the time that they could talk because I never practiced baby talk with them or anything like that. So we were speaking, having conversations when they were two and three Amen. years old. And to this day, we still have these, the three of us, we would sit down and we would have discussions. My children would, would, would come and they, they almost would speak to me very respectfully, of course, as little adults. So they will say mommy and they will ask me something. And then depending, even with my son, because I think even after what happened with his dad and I, one of my biggest concerns was I, I, I don't ever want him to make the same mistakes that we Amen. made with each other, you know? And so that I always had this concern. And they, in last year in particular, something happened and I had to have a really open, frank, honest discussion with him. So I took him to the beach. Amen. And no I told him, I beach. said, look, yeah. So I told him, I said, look, you're no longer a child. So I have to speak to you like the young man that you are. So this is not your mother talking, right? I am your friend now. And this, so I established the bubble. We yes. call it the bubble. Yes. So the bubble is a space. It's a safe space for my son to express himself however he chooses to express himself and the promise that i made to him is that anything said within the bubble remains in the bubble and that i have to remain calm regardless of what What's it is he result? tells me yes. in the bubble. yeah yeah so that my promise to him is that i would not switch back to mommy mode yeah that i would i can be your friend i can listen i can listen objectively in the bubble and that also the promise that he made to me is that when I ask him something in the bubble, that he has to be honest. Yes. He has to be honest. So that I activated the bubble for the first hey. time. And we spoke for about two hours. Oh. And coming out of that conversation, one of the things he told me is that, mommy, one of the reasons why I love you is because I can talk to you. Oh, hallelujah. You 
and that even if i tell you something uncomfortable you're not you're not afraid to say this is me making me uncomfortable and just go give myself a minute and come back but i don't take it out on him yeah. i don't i don't because i say to him i said one day you want to be somebody's husband one day you're going to be somebody's father and i want that i've raised you in such a way that when you become somebody's husband that you can communicate with that person because you have to understand that that if you don't have communication you can't make it in no relationship with nobody and that if you can't communicate with your children you will not be an effective parent mm. because everything that is going on in the world children don't have to access anything no they just get there they just get there they have get that. Tablet. They Google. Have tablet everything they want to find out they can type it hey the answer comes so that is why it is critical because parents have to sometimes step out of that parent role and you really kind of have to be your child's friend because we make the assumption that their children they don't have bills to pay they live in good they could wake up when they want they get food to eat they have clothes we buy stuff but when they go out to school school is a war zone misconception of, of misconception yeah. of behavioral attitude by parents they really parents yeah. really tell us i give you everything we want one more you want but there might be something that they want that right. you can give I- them Look at look at cyberbullying for example. A lot of parents have abdicated their responsibility to the computer and the tablet and the phone. So when the child is spending 2 and 3 hours on the phone talking with their friends, there's that opportunity for somebody to be bullying them online. Yes. And we've seen it happen where persons have been sending hurtful messages and 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 setting up pages to bully and and, and young people have committed suicide <laughs> as a result. So we as parents not the assumption that life is easy for our children it, it is not. not and we have to so that our job yes, has and we have to much yes and we have to take and we have to get yes, in there yes thank we have you. to get in there get in there we cannot assume that just because they look healthy that they are healthy yes. we cannot ex- assume that because they are physically fine that mentally and emotionally they are okay a lot of children are carrying around a lot of hurt a lot of children are carrying out, um around a lot of problems on their shoulders they're seeing their parents struggling and and for me because i have such an open relationship with my children i don't hide my struggle from them i don't hide i don't pretend to be yes, you, you you can't make them believe that like everything is this easy pretend Oh, I am getting this oh, I am getting the problem I, but I I I know everybody else is always said to them I need to prepare you guys for the day that I'm no longer here and I I for the day that I'm no here that that they can grow and they, they can thrive and they could remember the lessons that I that I that I taught them and remember the lessons that their grandparents taught them and that they can be upstanding contributing members of society but they can just be happy within themselves that they can um be great on their own that they don't seek external validation because i mean even to answer that question going back to being a single mother and stuff a lot of my self esteem was tied up in external validation mm. so the external validation was with my parents the external validation was with society the external validation was with whoever my partner was so that for me i was ha- unhappy with me if i didn't know that other people were was happy with, happy with me oh, yeah. oh so no, that was, miss boris when i got to the point where i realized the only validation i needed was from the man above and that was all that i ever needed and everything that i needed was already buried inside of me i just needed it to come out and show itself trust me oh, oh, yeah. from my purpose yeah that's so, why you went that's why you went straight back to school and didn't yeah. stop. that was awesome so yeah we're going into some politics now right <laughs> we have heard so much about miss miss boris we know that miss boris is ready to take the fight to trinidad we know of that course. you are going to perform well and excellent as a representative for Tobago West 
if you get the opportunity to do so. Mm -hmm. So when and how did you first become active in politics? Did your yes. did, did, did your parents have a part to play? You saw some politicking in your family? Wow. Oh, what pushed nice. you? What gave you <laughs> that extra incentive? I blame my father. I lay that squarely at his feet. <laughs> in a good way? <laughs> my father, uh, in a great way, in a great Amen. way. Because my father was one to, you see one thing? When news came on at seven o'clock, we all had to watch the news. We all had to sit and watch the news. So that from a very young age, we were exposed to what was going on in our country. I have a distinct memory of when the coup happened. Mm. I was four years old because my birthday is in September. So that was July. I was four going on to five. And I could remember the place having an air of darkness. This was oh, the stillness. Still, stillness. Yes. The place was quiet, but it wasn't the regular Hella quiet. It was just something different was in the air. And at five years old, I will distinctly remember that. And I could remember in the days following the coup, when the newspapers would come out with all the stories that my father religiously would sit at the dining room table and cut out all the newspaper articles. And he had this huge file with all the newspaper clippings, everything with respect to the coup. He had it in that file. He probably still has it for today. And we would watch the news and he would comment on certain things so that my father was deeply involved in politics from the time he was a young man. So that that, that attitude just kind of, that spread to us as children. I think I, I, I got mo my brother, my brother and I, the one right after me, we are the two that kind of got it the most. But my father was always, he, he's an orator. Now, mind you, he didn't go to high school, but when you hear my father speak, you would swear that he went to university I know. and these things. Because, because he, he read the newspaper, he listened to the news, yes, he yes, read the yes. Bible too? Religious. Read, yeah, yeah, he reads the Bible and he reads religious books as well. So, coming from my grandfather, my grandfather from part of it, he used to read a lot, my father reads a lot, I have a love of reading. So, I'm, I'm just like the two of them. And my father um, always was questioning and debating and he always engaged us in conversation. So as we grew, like when we became teenagers and stuff, we would have talks, we would have family discussions. And in those family discussions, he would ask us what we thought about certain things and allow us to express mm. ourselves. And so that was my, that my, my honing time. That was the time that time I was debate, being more, so yeah, like that was my first foray. Yes, so that was my first foray into that debate type style because it's one thing to to, to have a point is the, the other thing to sell it Amen. and he forced us to sell our point he forced us to sell our yes, viewpoint give you a verdict. He, he forced us to look at the different viewpoints now my father followed um what was deemed opposition politics from day one so my father was from the dac nar follower of ANR Robinson oh, so and he wasn't Murray. A PNM. Never. My family was never of that side. Um, so that was that was my foundation. Um, the thing about it is, is that that choice was never forced upon us, really. You know? Because my father always allowed us leeway when we went out into the world to see. And, and that was with everything. Not just politics, but religion as well. Because I am a Baha'i by birth. I grew up as a Baha'i. But we were exposed to different religions. I used to go to Christian church on a Sunday. I went to a Christian primary school and high school. Um, I went to Hindu ceremony. So we were exposed to a number of different religions. And, and you are, what religion are you now? Love is my religion. Oh, love is your religion. Oh, Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> I mean, regardless of how anybody chooses to worship or anything like that, once you love each other and you, you lead with love and everything you do comes from a place of love, to me, that's the only religion because God is love. It doesn't matter where you worship, where you feel comfortable spiritually. And I, and I have cultivated my relationship with God. We've always had this up and down relationship because my faith has taken 
a beating over the years and and that has come from different things it has come from my life experiences it also has come from the fact that i read a lot so that I've, I've questioned a lot i question the origins of christianity i question the origins of the hindu religion i question the islam religion and all of these religions i questioned everything that we have been taught but you know what it all comes back to the source which is god which is love we were born in love we were created out of love and if we do everything with that spirit of love then it doesn't matter what religion what, yes. you are it doesn't matter who is in front of you you can approach them with love you can approach them with understanding you can approach them from a place of i want to understand you i want to communicate with you i want to reach you and the only way to reach people is through the heart when you connect with somebody through their heart um if we were to lead with love in in more ways in this world we wouldn't have a lot of the problems that we have we wouldn't have greed we wouldn't have corruption we wouldn't have pride and vanity and all of these things because we would believe that if i deserve love then somebody else deserves love and all of us deserve love and we all deserve to live good we all deserve to thrive and prosper wherever we are Amen. so um in terms of, of my religion love is my religion i always well, I accept I that. I accept no, whatever, whatever, whatever <laughs> makes you recognize and respect humanity and care for your community. Yes. And, yes. and yes. the walk that you're going to walk that other people yeah, could that follow is, because you're making clearance for somebody else and not only for yourself. I sit back. So, yeah. awesome. So, yes. what made you choose to join PDP Party? as opposed to one of right. the other established oh. parties well let me tell you something i came through the youth movement so i was a member of the tobago youth council right and uh, i always wanted i you, i am in love with dr eastland mckenzie she yes. was an independent senator that's like, my girl up, right yes that's everybody, that's everybody auntie that's everybody grandmother you know and uh, I said to myself, if I ever enter politics, I want to be an independent senator because I want to be able to use my voice from that standpoint. I don't want to bat for a political party. I want to be able to speak truth, whatever the truth is. If somebody is doing well, I must be able to commend them. I must give them their claps. Yes. And if they're doing nothing, I must be able to cut them same way. And there must be no hard feeling about it because all we want is progress, correct? That's right. So that for me, I always admired her as an independent senator and her politics and her style because she never became a politician. She was always a people's representative. That is what I'm I don't about. want to be a politician. I don't want to be a politician. I'm not interested in being a politician. I aspire to be a representative of the people because I hope to go into the forum where I can use my voice to amplify the voices of those who, can't who I need to represent, who can't speak and who are not able to go into the forums that I can go into, right? So she was my first example of what I wanted my type of, of, of political choice to be. However, Tobago is at a crossroads. Hey. I could remember growing up under the Ho Choi Charles regime. And I could remember that even though Tobago wasn't given much at the time, we did so much with the little we had. We had such an impeccable work ethic. We were a productive people. We were a productive society. My father um, told me stories about the fact that they would go out on a weekend and work for free when they were building certain roads all over Tobago. He was working works at this time. And those young men who were working in these places, they're not even talking about overtime. This road needs to be built. This community needs to be connected. We going out and give our labor for free because this is for Tobago. This is for our family. This is for our friends. Amen. And that is what Tobago, that was our foundation. So I could remember how it was under Ho Choi Charles. So that when the other party came in, there was a gradual shift in culture. And now we are so far away from our moorings. We are so far removed from that foundation that we have that now the only things you can hear about this Tobago House of Assembly that, that Mr. Robinson and Mr. Murray and, and Mr. Davidson and all of these people who went before that they helped build and fight for, the only thing that we can hear is corruption 
and wasted and thievery and all of these things and I am ashamed. I am ashamed as a Tobigonian that we gave these persons the opportunity to build us and they broke us and they have been breaking us and it's time for us to stop that. It's time for us to arrest that. We have to arrest the fall so that when I examine their philosophy because they speak a good game eh? They look very good on the outside. When I looked at their internals, when I looked at how they treated one another, even in, in, in their last few elections and stuff, and I, and I saw how the lengths that people would go to destroy one another to just get power, to get access to power. I, I could not in good conscience be a part of that. I could not in good conscience stand with people who in front of cameras, they smile, but all of them are holding daggers behind their backs. So that when I looked at the PDP, I looked at the man who started the movement and he started by himself with one bullhorn on that street corner. And that spoke to me of strength and courage because it takes courage for one man to stand up and say, look, I'm recognizing that things are going wrong and that people don't have a voice because this was really time that there was no opposition in the THA. That's none, none, none. And it was 12 mil. And this man stood up and said, you know what? Tobigonians don't have a voice. And those who even want to speak of, they can't because the victimization is so heavy. And it's not other people victimizing us. It's not people who don't look like us victimizing us. It's the own people victimizing us. How we can live good if it is it's your family or your friend or people you grew up with, people who know you are, are victimizing you. And he stood up for something. And when I looked at that, the origin of the party, and then I looked at the persons who started to come on board with that philosophy. And when I looked at the family structure that was built out of that, because you have to build those bonds over time. But the underlying thing, the underlying philosophy about the PDP is building, you know, every community, child by child, building Tobago, community by community, child by child, village by village. When you hear that, you, you, you're talking about a vision that goes down to the smallest man, recognizing that even the babes among us, even our children have something to contribute and that this party would give them the opportunity to contribute for them to be able to articulate where do they want to see Tobago in 10 years? Where do they want to see Tobago in 20 years? How can we all come together and build that Tobago? And that philosophy is something that I live because I believe in family. I, I, I said it at the beginning of the interview. So that, 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 for that foundation, that sold me alone, you know? Um, so that, that I went on a cruise for my birthday last year and I came back and I always travel. I try to travel at least once or twice per year. And when I go outside and I see smaller Caribbean islands who have had far less access to resources than we have had, doing so much more with what they've gotten than we have been doing, I get home angry. Every time I come back, I'm angry because I'm disappointed. I'm disappointed that we're still having conversations about water supply in 2020. I'm, I'm disappointed that we're still having conversations about unequal access to educational opportunities in 2020. I'm disappointed that we're still having conversations about people having issues with pension and, 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 and salaries and promotions and gratuity in 2020. So that when I came back home, Farley, who I went to school with, he was in one class ahead of me and he also um, we're members of the Tobago Youth Council at the same time, so we've been friends for a number of years. Um, I said to myself, I'm going to come back home and support Farley's campaign to become the next Chief Secretary. Because I believe that he is the young man that we need in this time. I believe that, that he brings that, that balance of youth and experience. And he brings that balance of that, that good old country Tobago upbringing, you know, that village raising that child. Fali is the perfect example of a village raising a young man into a future leader of Tobago. He has traveled, he has seen what the world has to offer. He's seen where we are falling short. He's committed to that fight. He's committed to the ideal of, 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 of what the party is built on. And I think that at that for now, he, he has that support. He has the support of the generation before us. He has the support of the young people. And he has the support of everybody around him who wants to see Tobago progress. So I said to myself, and I mean, it, it, it came at a time when I was also evaluating my own personal journey because um, 
where I'm at now in terms of the current job that I hold, I was coming to the end of my tenure and I had to make a decision as to whether or not I wanted to continue or if I wanted to go do something else. I actually signed up to go to law school um, to finish my law degree because I started a law degree in 2009. Um, and I just, I did law for one year and, and then I, I got pregnant with my daughter. So you see, it's like, I call my children my degree babies because what ended up happening with my daughter is that I started a master's and I finished it with her. So my son is my bachelor's baby and my daughter is my master's baby. So I, I always tell them I have two degrees, one for each of you. So if I'm blessed to have any more children, I have to go for a doctorate. I like, right? I like, how, you're, I like how you're taking responsibility. Yes. <laughs> So when I was reevaluating my own personal um, decisions in terms of what next I will do, I decided that, um, that I would probably go finish my law degree. But then I took this trip, I came back and I came back upset. And then I had some personal situations happening at that time. I lost a couple of relatives all at the same time my uncle died. And in fact, I lost four relatives on the same day. And I started thinking about life. Very seriously. Four relatives the same thinking, day? Four relatives on the same day. I had an uncle and three cousins down the same day in October of last year. So I started evaluating my life. Purpose, purpose, purpose. Because I asked myself, and I started, this was a conversation I started having with God. And um, I'll tell you something about, about my relationship with God. I, I, I refer to, to myself as sanctuary. I call myself sanctuary because sanctuary is a trinity so at the top of sanctuary is my relationship with god and that is that is what gives me my purpose that is the thing that is the thing that i was created to do on one side of the triangle is my relationship with myself so me the conversations i have with me how i treat myself react to situations you know or um constantly evolving because you're always looking for elevation. Everything that happens to you, I, I'm not quick to get emotional about things because I always examine, what did I do to cause this situation? Mm. Or do I understand why this person did what they did and this was the result? So I always, I'm always looking for where did I go wrong or where did I go right? And if I misunderstood somebody, if I, if I did, then I'm not afraid to say that I'm sorry. And, and even with my children, if it's one thing that I've told them, I said, your mother is never afraid to apologize to you. If I'm sorry, I will tell you. You know why? Because I need you to grow up knowing that when you do wrong, you need to apologize. That's and some right. of us do ever learn that lesson. Some of us, we stuck it for Some of us, we know, you know, we go through life and we do people wrong mm. and we never apologize. And tomorrow, it's never promised. So that in my experiences in life, you're literally here and you're going tomorrow. I've seen it all the time. So all of these things happen at the same time, force me to reevaluate, or not even reevaluate, to have the conversation with God. And a real conversation at that. Because every day you get up, you pray, you say, God, thank you for waking me up this morning. I hope you bless my family, bless my children, bless me throughout this day, keep me safe. You know, my prayers are kind of like the same things. Over. I don't really ask God for anything. I remember being small and asking God for rollerblades. But outside of that, I've never really asked God for anything. I just ask him to bless me and keep me safe. You know, I keep my children safe and my family safe and, and that's it. Um, but during that time, God kind of needed my attention so that everything that was happening with me there was some inner turmoil going on so sanctuary was being activated so sanctuary with god sanctuary my relationship with myself and sanctuary my environment so i'm very particular about the environments that i choose to be in which includes the people that i allow into my life the people that i allow into my circle my physical environment because your physical environment also has a bearing on how you you react and how you operate if you are unhappy, chances are your physical environment has something to do with that, you know? So that's what I call my trinity of sanctuary. Yeah, and that's deep. God, so God was, was, was trying to get my attention. And there are times that he does it, you know? So, and, so in the sense, it's God with me and I'm with God. Mm -hmm. So he was trying to get my attention. Attention, yes. And uh, when, um, when I came back, and I, and, I, and I said, okay, I'm going to support Farley because Farley has been talking to me for years. Since the last CHA election, he was talking to me about coming out and that kind of thing. And I just didn't feel I was ready. I spoke to God and he said, no. So I leave that. 
I'm not going and beg God to change your mind. If God tell me no, then I leave that and I say, well, maybe it's not for me, right? Um, but then this time, when I started having the conversation with God, I wasn't getting no. I got that this is the time. So, so that was so this, my. This was the time. Yeah. So was this that, the that time to just up, go national every, instead of going local? Well, well, here's what, right? What makes so you? That I what make you? Local. What make you? So let me finish this story, right? <laughs> yeah. So what made finish. you? What made you so young? Mm. With no political experience on the local level, right? And getting ready to go in the big yard, right? <laughs> from, from the goal. 